forward. Uh, I really do not understand decolonizing curriculum or decolonizing education uh, at the point when uh, Andrea asked me if I would be interested to, uh, to take on the challenge to see if I can look into how School of Global Studies could decolonize its education. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's like a beam drop in the middle of the ocean, and I don't really know where to start. Um, and then I, I try to look at what is happening at, at different universities and different uh, institutions across the world. And I could find some common commonality with, uh, around them at the same time. There are uh, success of some, 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 some project, and there is a failure in some of the project. And, uh, uh, and and there's uh, in the mid, in, and while I was working that out in my mind, uh, I realized that uh, success is a kind of a historically radical university that was actually set up in the 60s to basically in the in the in the, uh, in the uh, peak of uh, decolonizing the global south, and uh, in fact, success has been in the forefront. I mean, particularly is. Um, ahead of other institutions in terms of uh, looking at how uh, experiences of decolonizing Africa then uh, can actually be translated into education. And uh, in the 70s, there is a Professor um, Griglo, Raphael Griglo, uh, was the head of school then, and he made a conscious effort to, 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 uh, to decolonize the institution at that point in time by setting up African and uh, Asian studies. Yeah, Af uh, Afras. Yeah, and uh, I, I got to see him and I got to speak to him about why he, he, he thought that was necessary at that point in time in the seventies. You know, people are just talking about decolonizing Africa, but that actually not really. And when you look at uh, institutions like SOAS or uh, Oxford, and they basically participate in the uh, in the coloni uh, colonization of Africa or the global south, where um, the elite are going to those schools, are uh, trained to become. An, uh, um, an administrator of the colonies when they go back to, to the colonies. So basically, it was not really a critique of colonialism itself. It's actually to perpetuate colonialism. And uh, success was doing the opposite of that. But at some point, I think when Thatcher came in, um, neoliberalism kicks in into a big form and then a gradual uh, chipping away of the, of the, of the, of the, um, the autonomy that the uh, academics or academic has. And what, what is really stood out in, in, in the sense of that was that at that point, Sussex was very conscious of an uh, interdisciplinary approach. In fact, it was one of the founding principles of its uh, core pioneers, you know. And uh, interdisciplinary approach didn't come into uh, popularity like known until early 2000, you know. And Sussex had been already being the vanguard of that at the beginning. But what, what becomes strange to me is that. <coughs> At some point, success lost touch with his past. So, basically, uh, uh, particularly with the way I was saying earlier, when new neoliberal new policies came in, uh, what, what then happened was that uh, uh, departments were made, made, made to compete against each other through REF. I don't know if I'm going to talk about REF. Um, it's a way which uh, departments have to weigh themselves as a kind of a proactive and, and you know, uh, world class uh, institution. So, in a way, that, that break uh, affects the interdisciplinary approach which success has founded uh, at that point in time. I think they, they one, one of the uh, big, big examples is COG, which is the uh, collaboration between psychology, sociology, and anthropology department all in one school. So, in a way, you can have a psychology. That was the idea then, but then when REF kicks in, and Sussex basically split the whole schools into different ways because every department has to show they are uh, economically viable. And, and, and that was what our success uh, become the ghost of its former self, and <laughs> also to say. And yeah, I, I hope uh, when I have the time to speak, I'll probably explain more on what I found, but that was the, the starting point for me to really realize what has gone wrong. And uh, because Sosa seems to be making the attempt to decolonize earlier and all the solutions, like all this, all the outcome we're talking about now was actually embedded in the Sosa's um, founding father's principle. And it just, I don't know, it just
just become a cliche now. Mm -hmm. yeah. So what we have is books in our libraries, we have old reading lists, we have a lot of archival material that showed that earlier on Sussex did have this very strongly on its agenda. We also have a rhetoric of internationalisation, which is more about recruitment of students from international universities or sending of our students to international universities than actually about internationalism, the spirit of which was very much part of early Sussex, or about actually really seriously and properly addressing the coloniality of our practices, letting it hard bring it into all of our systems. So part of this coming from here right now is also something about trying to revisit some of those radical roots, to not forget our past, to reclaim and reinvent our past, but also to be very much part of a contemporary moment, a contemporary movement, uh, which is very strongly felt. So you who are here today, there are other people across the campus who would like to see some change. So it's a wonderful opportunity to have that. So I'd like to throw the event open and then uh, and just to explain a bit about our programme. So we're going to spend the morning um, looking at what does academic freedom and pluriversality, what would it mean, what would it look like? Bud is going to speak, Lookman is going to share the results of his research. We're going to have Suman and Nandi who's recorded, she's in India, um, and she's from a movement called